My name is Virginia Hall, and I'm here today to introduce you to Roger Rule, author of The Rifleman's Rifle and host of this series of episodes, Special Guns with Roger Rule. Thank you, Virginia, and thank you, viewers, and welcome to my 21st episode of Special Guns with Roger Rule. What do we have today? In the last episode, we covered two custom-made rifles. Uh, today, I want to return to the world of shotguns, while most of the ones we've looked at at the... Uh, in the evolution of the over and under have been expensive doubles. Today we have one that is much more modestly priced, yet it still stands tall in the evolution of the best over and unders ever made. It's another Beretta company made uh, shotgun and from the model, their model line of 680 series, it's the model S687 marketed by as the uh, Diamond Pigeon. And just to recap a bit, in a few of our videos, we covered several guns in the uh, evolution of the over and under. The first successful one manufactured on a volume scale was the Great Browning Superposed. We covered that in episode 14. Then in episode 15, we learned that in March 1926, Pietro Beretta of the Beretta Company, after seeing the patents granted to John Moses Browning for his Superposed, recognized that Browning was on to something, the potential of a new market sector for a popular over and under double gun. Pietro Breda did not want to be left behind. He decided it was something his large manufacturing company in Gardone, Italy should explore. And I covered a synopsis of the history of uh, Breda in that video. When the Browning Superpose came out in 1935, this was during Pietro Beretta's management, while Pietro was actively seeking the production of small arms for military and law enforcement, he had not ignored the sporting arms that had been the company's strength. Like Browning, he was very much aware of the English over and under guns, particularly those made by Boss and Woodward. Although they were technically brilliant, they involved too much handwork, causing them to be expensive and low volume. He could see that Browning Superposed, on the other hand, could be manufactured in a much higher volume with a price that created a different market sector than the small market of the English guns made by hand. Like the Browning gun, Breda needed a design that his company could produce in numbers for his large factory. From episode 15, we also learned that Beretta turned to his brilliant in-house designer, Tulio Marangoni, to begin the development work for an over and under to compete with the superposed. Marangoni had worked at Beretta all his life. He did not like Browning's design and was very vocal about it, saying he found its underlug system clumsy and unrefined. In a Beretta catalog later, the Browning superposed would be described as very high, heavy, and ugly an insult that the Italian trade would continue to use against the superpose for the next 70 years. To reduce the height in his design, Marangoni rejected the underlug system and instead turned to a locking system that mounted the barrels low in the action body on stub pins and locked them by means of a top cross bolt that emerged from the upper left of the receiver, similar to the German Kirsten crossbolt. Additional locking was provided by angled shoulders on the barrel that engage angled cutouts in the receiver walls. This last feature has become a key element of the Beretta signature locking system. Another big difference from the Browning was that Beretta used their own monoblock barrels that they had pioneered in 1913 and still use on most shotguns today. In the monoblock system, the barrels are made separately from the breech block, then soldered in place, reducing distortion and allowing for very precise alignment. Pietro Beretta recognized early on that Marangoni's solution still would be expensive to build, so he opted to add a premium specification, planning it from the onset to be a true side lock to give the gun additional value. We covered that also in episode 15. 
Today we pick up where, uh, where Beretta eventually adapted Marangoni's famous locking system designed with the side stub pins and the angled barrel shoulders, but did away with the top cross bolt, which was expensive to make. The new locking improvement kept the angled barrel shoulders, but allows for two small conical locking bolts, one on each side of the action, to replace the top cross bolt allowing allowing for a lower manufacturing cost. And to bring the cost down even further, it was to be made in a more reasonably priced box lock action instead of a side lock. When Garcia was the sole distributor for Breda in the USA, this very successful box lock shotgun was brought into this country as the BL series, BL standing for box lock. The lowest grade was BL1, and it continued up through BL6, the top version with full hand engraving. In the 28th edition of the Blue Book of Gun Values by S.P. Fistad on page 23, the caption under the photo of a BL6 reads, and I quote, When the Browning superposed grades 1 to Midas, Oh, excuse me, I read that wrong already. While a Browning superposed grades 1 to Midas were a lot more well-known and popular with American shooters than Beretta's competitive over and under models during the 1960s and 70s, the Beretta over and under shotguns were every bit as good in quality. In the case of the BL-6, Beretta's top-of-the-line standard production gun, it retailed during 1973 for approximately the same as the Browning superposed standard grade, close quote. The BL line would go on to uh, emerge into the Model 55 with improvements and eventually evolve into the 680 series, the 680, 682, 685, 6, and 7. The 680 series was impro were uh, improved and they still had Marangoni's hinging system with bifurcated lumps and stud pins at the knuckle, but it had replaced the more expensive Kirsten-style cross bolt or third lock of the original Marangoni design used on the SO series. This has been replaced with a tent twin conical bolts at mid-height that emerge from the breech face and engage two small round sockets at either side of the top barrel's chamber mouth when the gun's closed. This is a great design for uh, feature because it's less costly to produce and even less when produced in a box lock rather than a side lock action. The design also has the added feature that conical bolts may be replaced by oversized parts allowing for wear, as can the hinge pins. So that's... Uh, that's what we have here today at the top of the line in this series, the Model S687 Diamond Pigeon. When was this gun manufactured? 1998, according to Breda's serial number ledger, 10 years after it was first introduced. But yet, this is still considered one of the early ones with a hand-chased engraving by the very famous engraver Bottega C. Giortonelli. Giortonelli is known to many gun collectors as the artist who engraved the famed Grand Slam Bobby Jones and Arnold Palmer commemoratives built by Renato Gamba, which sold for $20,000 each. While we can see the, uh, the placeholder that this shotgun holds in the evolution of the shotgun design, capturing the low profile design by Marangoni, uh, advancing forward to the new design that, that's less costly, um, there is yet another reason I chose this particular gun. A few years ago, in October 15, 2014 issue of The Field, that's a respected British magazine, an article was published entitled The World's 20 Best Shotguns. It listed them in order, with number one being the best shotgun in the world. The article created uh, much contra controversy, as you might imagine either omitting someone's favorite gun or giving their favorite gun a different place in the hierarchy. The article included the great guns by Purdy, Holland Holland, Boss, Dixon, Browning, Superimpose, Parazzi, and Fabri, 
uh, among others, you know, referring to as being the top 20 shotguns in the world. Then at the end of the article, the author summed up, I have a quote here, how he summed up. What is the best shotgun in the world? One gun on a desert island for the next 20 years? To use the vernacular, that's a no-brainer. The Plain Jane Beretta Silver Pigeon, model 686, simply could not be bettered. It offers the most reliable bang for the least buck. Close quote. That gun, Silver Pigeon, is similar to the one we have today? To use the field writer's description, the Silver Pigeon is simply a Plain Jane grade of the one we have here. The di this Dine Pigeon model 687 uh, E-E-L-L -L is um, an upgraded version. <clears throat> and I think, uh, you, do you remember what E-E-L -L stands for, Virginia? I think the E-E part is extra, extra. That's good enough. Extra, extra, luso, luso. That's Beretta's title for the highest grade of a model. As you can see, uh, this gun is absolutely beautiful and one of the top of the line, not only for Beretta, but also for fine shotguns in general. This particular one has the famous master engraver's touch. Uh, and we can see this is a high grade by the full coverage and quality of the engraving and the remarkable high grade figure of the Turkish walnut stock. Let's examine the design a little closer. Since this is a box lock, the side plates are really, are, they look like side locks, they're really side plates that allow the engraver more canvas for his artistry. And being an E-E-L-L, -L, this one is lavishly engraved by Giottinelli. For the uh, finish, the side plates, the action receiver, top, bottom, sides, and top tang are all coin finished. The blued parts include the barrels with the low profile matted, matted ventilated rib, the forearm iron, uh, the Anson and Dealey forearm release, the trigger guard, the safety button, and the cross hatched uh, action lever. The single trigger is nickel plated with a smooth face. But mechanically, the safety is manual, as preferred by uh, competition shooters. The ejectors are automatic, and the trigger is selective. To select the choice of barrels, the safety button is pushed either right or left. When shifted to the left, one red dot shows, which means the lower or under barrel will fire first. When pushed to the right, Two red dots show, indicating the upper over barrel will fire first. For the visible inscriptions when the gun is assembled, on the underside of the receiver at the hinge, we see made in Italy. Also on the bottom of the receiver, surrounded by heavy engraving, we find three lines of lettering, P. Beretta, engraved in script, followed by S687EELL -E in uppercase, followed by Diamond Pigeon, again in script in very small letters. On the right side of the receiver's lower tang, it's engraved with the word patented in uppercase font, and on the left side is the master engraver's name and script, Bottega C. Giortonelli. On the right and left sides of the receiver, at the chamber walls, it reads P. Beretta. Forward from that, Farther down the barrels, on the left side, we see P. Breda Gardone VT Italy. With Breda's trademark logo, which comprises the letters PB, surrounded by an oval. Over the left chamber, it is inscribed Skeet SB slash SB 12 gauge 2 and 3 quarters dash 28 inches. On the right barrel, in very small print, there's another inscription. Warning, read in instruction book for safe operation. And under that, free from Breda USA Corp. ACKK MD. And a very small font on the right side of the chamber, made in Italy. The inlaid gold oval on the stock has not been inscribed. And in examining the engraving, first we see its full coverage, masterfully executed with game scenes on the two side plates. 
On the right are three woodcocks in reeds surrounded by scroll engraving. On the left are two mallard ducks hovering over a lake, again accompanied with scrolls. On the underside of the receiver, there's a snipe in flight with branches in the background engulfed with scrolls. All of the other engraved parts are surrounded with scroll engraving. These include the remainder of the receiver's sides, hinge pins, top, trigger guard, top action lever, forearm iron, and forearm release. And as the as a reminder, this is hand-chased engraving by Gio Tonelli and signed. It's not machine-made engraving as in the case on the current versions of this model. Let's check this shotgun out. First, I want to check for safety. You can see the chambers are empty. Mm -hmm. Closing it. Virginia, do you like this wood? I do. It seems like every gun you have for us has such beautiful wood. Yes, uh, looking at the stock and forearm, the Turkish Walnut is near exhibition grade for the EEL -E -E -L -L version. It's a, uh, exceptional wood with excellent color and contrast to warm browns with deep brown and black streaks, and in particular, a marble cake figure on both sides of the butt making rich, interesting patterns. The wood is finished with a high gloss protective coat that emphasizes the figure's character. The stock has a classic comb with deep flutes and its full rounded pistol grip. The butt is finished with a color coordinated dark brown leather covered recoil pads, very nicely done. The semi beaver tail forearm is thick and rounded slimming down with finger grooves running along the barrels. The checkering on both the stock and the forearm are hand checkered patterns in fine 26 uh, lines per inch, perfectly executed. For the stock, it has two panels of two point patterns that are independent of each other. The forearm has one panel of wraparound che che checkering, making a, an interesting reverse point uh, of the uncheckered space above the forearm release uh, and the uh, forearm side checkering goes up halfway stopping at the finger channels and ending at the forearm nose in a nice parallel pattern. All the checkering has double borders and no runovers. For the dimensions, the length of pull is 14 and 3 8 inch, the drop of comb is 1 and a half inch and the drop of the heel is 2 and a half inch. The weight of the gun is 7 pounds 14 ounces and the stock has neutral cast for either the right or left hand. The point of balance is perfect at the knuckle which makes the shotgun come up naturally to the shoulder while still having a good feel for the forward hand. Let's now feel, disassemble it and uh, look at the major components. Just like most shotguns, it has an Anson and Dealey forearm release. Take the forearm off first. Move the top action lever to the right. Let the barrels down about 45 degrees and they come right off. And we'll take these, com these uh, components and examine them at the side table. Here we have the Beretta S687 EEL disassembled into its major components displayed in its factory case. The Beretta heavy-duty styrene case is charcoal gray with one combination lock and three latches. <clears throat> the interior of the lid is printed with the Beretta logo and with large Beretta letters. Uh, you can see that. Accessories include the uh, Beretta gun sock, Breda oil bottle, Breda instructions manual for the gun, and an Breda instructions manual for the combination lock. The choke pouch includes two right extended chokes, number six improved modified, number seven full, and three Briley thin wall chokes, skeet improved modified and full, and a choke wrench. Let's look at each part. First, I'll pick up the stock in action. As dim disassembled, the action lever is locked open to the right. This is called a hold open top lever. The serial number is under on the tang underneath it, the top lever. 
looking at the breech face, you can see the ends of two conical locking bolts hidden in their recesses in the sides of the receiver, right here. When I push the button in the receiver face to release the top lever, it brings the top lever in line with the top tang and you can see the two conical locking bolts emerge from the recesses. The other moving parts of course are the strikers as well as the ejector rods at the base of the receiver. Notice the walls of the action from form an additional lock with the complementary parts on the barrel block with these Beretta signature angled or uh, trapezoidal locking lugs. Looking inside the receiver, we see the strikers are not bushed, a feature usually found only on handmade guns. Inside the bottom of the receiver, which would be the water table on the side-by-side, -side, there are four Gardon and Brescia proof marks. Also, there are two stampings PSF and FD, FND, both very faint and hard to see. In the hinge area inside, we see Marangoni's idea of mounting the barrels low in the action body on stub pins instead of the traditional hinge pin with the underlug logging system used on most guns, including the Browning Superposed, which caused its action height to be much taller than the Beretta design. Now let's look at the barrel assembly. For the locking system, looking at the chambers, we see the two recesses on each side that made up with the conical bolts from the receiver when the action is fully closed. Under them are the automatic ejectors, which can be disassembled and assembled by hand for easy cleaning. At the top of the barrel assembly on both sides, we see two lugs that made up with the receiver when the action is closed. The forward one aligns in front of the action. The rear one, uh, rear ones on both sides are angled or trapezoidal ones that match uh, to the complementary parts on the side, sides of the receiver when closed. On the back side of these trapezoidal lugs, notice the replaceable wear takedown shoulders screwed on. They are special on this gun as they are generally found, not found on this model, only on the early double E, double L versions. These side locking lugs are precisely the same as I introduced with the Breda S05 in my episode 15, which also had the replaceable wear takedown shoulders. Now looking at the front lower side of the barrel flat, or barrel block in this case, we see the two C-shaped cutouts for the hinge stub pins, which bypass the need for a, a full pin from side to side or an axle, also allowing for a lower height to the action. So basically, these last details were Marangoni's idea, his solution to avoid the hinge bolt or pin, setting the locking lugs on the sides of the frame rather than underneath it to keep the profile low while he then used the Kirsten top bolt for traditional additional strength, Beretta has, over time in this design, replaced the top bolt with these conical bolts, also placed along the sidewalls, which continue to keep the profile of the receiver low. This system has become the Beretta signature. While we are looking at this, notice the jeweled or engine turned sides of the barrel block. For markings, on the left side of the upper barrel, those inscriptions that are visible when the gun is assembled have already been described. But on the lower barrel, hidden from view and assembled, we see Excelsior high strength alloy steel. On the right barrel side, there are no inscriptions below the stock line. On the underside of the barrel block, the serial number is stamped L74965B. Another number on the underside of the barrel between the forearm locking stud and the barrel block is 66425, followed by BB53C. And four proof marks are on the underside of the lower barrel's chamber.
These barrels are separated by a ventilated rib and the upper barrel wears a ventilated rib nicely crosshatched to dissipate glare and it's fitted with a single ivory front bead for quick sighting. Breda markets this as their strata rib. Now let's look at the forearm. Looking at the one piece forearm, the interior metal is jeweled, held by two screws or bolts that can be seen when the gun is assembled. The numeri <coughs> numerical part of the serial number is inscribed in the jeweling. We see the movable forearm iron levers. While the forearm release is an Anson and Dealey lever release, Breda has designed it with a sleek style different from most guns with a user-friendly finger access, making it much easier to use than the traditional design. When the with forearm off, notice the wood's delicate shape and how fragile the forearm looks, being narrow and yet still serving its purpose. I can attest that it is a strong design despite its delicate look as I have fired thousands of rounds through this gun myself and there have been no breakage, chips or damage of any kind to the forearm. Now reassembling the shotgun, pick up the action, the barrels, put the, put the barrels at 45 degrees, raise them up, the top lever comes over. As it locks, the two conical bolts will engage the barrels and the top lever returns to center. Uh, this, then insert the forearm levers, ejection levers into the action and raise it in place to you hear it locks and voila, it's reassembled. It is, um, it's in the cocked uh, battery right now. The best way to leave it is to insert two snap caps and snap the triggers to release the tension on the mainspring. You have to slide the trigger uh, release lever back and forth to manipulate the trigger for each barrel. Then uh, place it on safe by pressing it. The uh, safety to pull the safety rearward. I'm gonna set the gun down. Uh, referring to the article in the field, I agree with the author that if I were on a desert island and had only one shotgun to take with me for the next 20 years, one of the Beretta 686 or 687 models would be my choice as well. And I agree for the same reasons that were given in that article. Um, he listed, the author listed design excellence, aesthetic quality, overall form, reliability, decorative detail, integrity of materials, shooting performance, and value of money. Breda's Diamond Pigeon fulfills that bill very well. Value for money. How expensive is this gun? The, th the 37th edition of the Blue Book of Gun Values shows the current manufacturer's suggested retail price for this gun at $7,825 with an add-on of 10 to 20% for the earlier manufacturer with the hand-chased engraving. Since this engraver is one of the most famous, I would say this one would, is one that would be in the 20% add-on range which would bring the total to $9,390, but that would be for a new gun. Hmm. Uh, for a 98% condition like this one, it would drop to about $6,300. There might be a, a, a little premium for this one being an early one with the replaceable wear take-up shoulders. And remember, this is an S687EELL Diamond Pigeon, the highest grade for the model. 
if you wanted to buy a lower grade for the Desert Island, the 686 Silver Pigeon 1 lists for about 2400 new. And if cost is a major concern, you can find nice used ones for even with even more savings. I think that's the lowest price I have heard on any gun in these episodes. <laughs> you may be right. So to sum up, the Model 687 action improved with its twin conical locking lugs at mid-height, which allow it to lock up positively, positively without the extra bulk of the underlug, still minimizes uh, the vertical distance between the eye and the supporting hand. When you bring the gun to your shoulder, the sighting plane meets your view instinctively. And independently from the beauty of this gun, a Model 687 EELL, known for its durability and reliability, even without the higher cost of a top cross bolt and side locks of the SO series, still meets the criteria of being an heirloom to pass along to your next generation. This winds up our video today. Thank you, Virginia. And thank you, viewers, for watching. And if you enjoyed this episode, I invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel and share with others. And I hope you join us for our next episode on Special Guns with Roger Rule. If you want to get involved with these types of guns, I recommend GunsInternational.com. The owners are great people. I know them and have been using their website since they started. I find it the best source for both buying and selling any great collectible gun.